Um, so let's make a start. So today we're going to talk about the value of standards in sustainability reporting. Um, we are very much aware that there are all kinds of sustainability, CSR, ESG, GHG reporting standards out there. And so we think it's really useful to spend a little bit of time talking about how they all work in very general terms and then talk about one that we think is quite exciting and is certainly generating quite a lot of noise, I think, for very good reasons. Give them a chance to talk a little bit about what they do, how they do it, and where the value is. Um, so some very quick kind of housekeeping things. We're going to try desperately to keep the session under one hour. Uh, we usually do pretty well at that. We'll have a little bit of time of me talking, a little bit of time up from SASB, and then we will have time for questions at the end. And that's obviously the important thing. If you do have questions, then please use the GoToWebinar interface. Uh, you can ask questions there. We will get to them at the end. We will do our best to answer all of them. And if we don't answer them during the webinar, we will come back to you and answer them outside of the webinar as well. Um, as well, everything is being recorded for better or worse. And we will, of course, be sharing the recording with you after. So you'll have access to the slides, access to use YouTube. Um, to the recording by YouTube, so you can always go back and listen to, to us talk again, if that is something you'd like to do. Um, so without further ado, let's make a start. So as I said, what's being covered today, we'll do a little bit of time on introductions, so you know who I am and who else is on the call, because I'm never quite on my own. Uh, we'll cover materiality at a very high level. We'll talk in about frameworks, about how they drive better sustainability reporting. We'll then pass it over to SASB, and we'll talk a little bit about how they work, where they've come from, and how it provides value. And then, as we said, time at the end for questions. So the first thing, and this is obviously my favorite subject, is let's talk about Sustainit. So my name's Joe. I am the principal sustainability consultant here at Sustainit. I've been with the company now for six years, I think. Please don't hold me to that. It's been quite a while. Um, and we are sustainability data consultancy. That's how we describe what we do. We help our clients understand what kind of ESG, sustainability, CSR data they have access to, help them understand how accurate it is, how usable it is, how useful it is, and then help make sure that that's not a single point in time. Help them move forward with that data. And so when we start talking about some of our larger clients, then that becomes about data management and about software and about reporting. And so we have 21 partners worldwide, as you can see there. We've, we help more than 68,000 users in various software systems, or even in Excel in some cases, manage their data. And whilst carbon isn't all we do, it's, it's a part of what we do, and it's certainly one of the most um, numerically startling parts of what we do. So. 14 million tons of CO2 uh, was monitored last year through software or systems or processes that we've helped our clients put in place. That's quite a nice number to be able to throw out there. So that's us. Obviously, as I've, as I've mentioned, we're not the only ones in this call. We're also on with SASB. So I'll pass you over. And if I let you, Levi, talk a little bit. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, good day, everyone, and thanks for joining today's webinar. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background on SASB or the uh, Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. Um, so SASB is a 501c3 nonprofit, which means we're an independent organization that's uh, you know developed basically for uh, education and development of standards on sustainability issues. So really SASB's focus is to develop sustainability standards uh, geared towards investors, so really getting at that investor use case. Uh, and in doing so, we're really working to make you know, these standards that are, are cost effective for companies to report on and decision useful for investors. So what that means is SASB takes a materiality lens that, that aligns with the US Supreme Court's definition of materiality uh, and really works to develop sustainability topics that are likely to constitute material information. Um, so that's a little bit of background on SASB, and uh, we'll, we'll have some great time to go uh, a little bit more into the work we've done so far, and, uh, and I think uh, how that you know, relates to the value of sustainability standards more. All right. Thanks very much. So we'll fly on, and we'll talk a little bit about 
materiality. And I really wanted to keep what I said about materiality at a very high level. I think it's one of those areas that's been a reasonably recent introduction to sustainability. It's not a phrase that's natively familiar to everybody. And so I think there's a value in just spending a bit of time talking about it at quite a high level. And I know because I know these things, uh, because I've seen these slides that Levi will talk about it in a bit more detail as, as it pertains to SASB. But at a very high level, I wanted to say, well, this is kind of what materiality is. <laughs> and so I was very, very lazy with the very first point here, which is the quality of being relevant or significant. Um, and that's a dictionary definition. It's when you start to dig into what that means that I think it's more useful. Materiality, in terms of the broader reporting requirement, isn't a new concept. It's new to sustainability, but it's not a new concept overall. And so that's why it's worth spending a bit of time talking about it. It is the process by which trivial matters are removed from the reporting requirement. And it's the process by which an insistence or emphasis is placed on matters which are important. An obvious example of this for me is one of our clients who are a travel agency. They operate and run holidays, vacations um, for their customers globally. Now, when they come to talk about their environmental impact, then they have hotels, they have offices, they have a printing process by which magazines and material are sent out. But they also have aeroplanes. And so I think this is a great example of materiality for me. Their environmental impact, their carbon impact is primarily from one place. And so that's what they've got to talk about. That's what's material to them. It, it's a way of making sure that you spend the time you need talking about the things that are actually important either to yourself or to external stakeholders rather than, sp than spending time trying to cal make calculations, trying to collate data, trying to answer questions that really don't have an impact on your overall sustainability landscape. As it says there in the final point, it is a recognized convention. This goes back to some of the you know, kind of turn of the 20th century regulations on what should be reported in terms of financial disclosure. So materiality is a well-established convention. It's new to sustainability, or reasonably new to sustainability, which is why I think there's still a lot of hand-wringing about it. But there are methodologies out there that will help with it. And it really does allow you to concentrate on the things that are important to your business. It allows you to talk about what you want to talk about. So what does materiality look like? And I've seen all kinds of graphics try and illustrate what materiality looks like as a whole. And it's a tricky thing to do because you're effectively trying to draw a three-dimensional image on a two-dimensional map. And this is a way of doing it I quite like um, because it, it tracks two important things, your internal and your external stakeholders. And those are the people you've got to be able to talk to. It's investors. It's customers, and it's employees, and it's the board. And if they're interested in this data, if it's relevant to them, then that's got to be high on the materiality matrix. So effectively, it's in terms of this graph, it's the things at the ends of both the X and Y axis, and obviously then things that are in the middle that are high on both, um, are, are going to be the most important. This is actually lifted from a case study I did for another company we work with and in this case the actual size of the bubbles is the amount of data available and you can see for them you know we've got some great stuff in the very top right where they've got a reasonable amount of data and it's very important to them um, they've got some small challenges with this um, where there's some stuff quite clearly in the top bracket of materiality where they don't have as much data uh, what you also find and this is one of those traps that i think can be quite easy to fall into is that you can find that you have an awful lot of data for areas that aren't as material. And in those cases, there is very little you can do about that. You know, it's data, it's there, it's great, but 
So it's not material you shouldn't be talking about. So there we go. Something to be aware of when you start to look at what your materiality looks like. So why do materiality? Apart from the fact that more and more frameworks now want you to do it, and see SASB is one of them, GRI with the G4 guidelines and on have required it as well. There are other reasons also. It established, and this first point I think is is really useful. It establishes what you should be talking about. It's all well and good talking about sustainability as one great big subject, and it's such a broad subject as well. You know, it covers everything from environment all the way through to health and safety to supply chain to human rights and all the way back again. There's an awful lot you can be talking about. If you don't have a, a way of focusing that, then sustainability disclosures can be unwieldy in the extreme. And so talking effectively about what's material to your business, make sure you're talking about things that impact you and that you can have an impact on. It allows you to concentrate on what's important. It allows you to make sure that you're not spending hours and hours and hours of time trying to find bits of data that aren't really something you should be spending time on. I am probably the worst example of a magpie mind that I know. I love the shiny things or the, or the interesting challenge, and I will get distracted by them. Um, both professionally and at home, and the amount of kind of shiny gadgets I, I come home with is a testament to that. Materiality will help you guard against that because you'll spend your time focused on the things that are important. And then finally, it helps when comparing apples and oranges. No two businesses are alike, and even two businesses in the same industry have an awful lot of things, have more points of divergence than points in common. And so making sure that you're reporting on materiality helps compare your efforts with those of other organizations, I think, more reasonably. It allows you to see, you know what, well, these are the things that are important to us and these are the steps being taken, rather than, well, we're doing all of these things to move in a nebulous direction. It gives a sense of movement in a specific way. I think that's why overall materiality is <laughs> definitely not going anywhere. I think it's something that's very worthwhile being a part of the initial steps towards sustainability. There we go. Okay, on to frameworks. And how do they drive better reporting? I saw a slide recently, another um, seminar I was at, where they actually had a list of some of the frameworks out there and I knew most of them I didn't know all of them obviously there's DJSI there's FTSE for good there's GRI there's CDP and obviously now there's the water disclosure body that's kind of associated with that when you look into supply chain and there's stuff like SEDEX there's the Maplecroft frameworks obviously there's SASB and I should mention that probably at the start there we go um, and there's more and there's more and there's more the the number of frameworks out there can be a little dizzying at times. Um, so how does that help you? So this is the most important thing. What is a framework actually for? What does it do? And it says it right there. It tells you what you should be reporting. As I said when I was talking about materiality, it is very easy to create an entire spectrum of sustainability reporting and just throw it into a report and say, here we go, this is everything we do. And I've seen sustainability and CSR reports like that, and I will absolutely read them because that's the kind of guy I am. However, it doesn't always communicate effectively what initiatives or what is being done in terms of being a more sustainable company. If you know these are the things we have to be, or these are things we want to be, or these are things we should be reporting on, then you spend your time talking about those and you create a much more focused sustainability report. It also creates comparability. We're back to apples and oranges. If you're able to say against this framework we're doing X, we're doing Y, we're doing Z or Z, I realize there are quite a few Americans on the call, then you're able to 
be compared more easily against not just your competitors, but also across industries as well. Because they're also using the same framework. You can see this is what's going on. This is how they're doing these things. It gives you an opportunity to talk in the same language as other companies who are taking sustainability seriously. And that leads me on to the third part of this. It demonstrates that commitment to sustainability. It illustrates very effectively that sustainability isn't just something that's being done as a tack on or being added on to a, a broader report. You know, there is a commitment there. The frameworks set out KPIs, they set out methodologies, they set out data requirements. I would love to say that you know, post Paris Agreement, we are we have reached the end of sustainability reports being full of we will seek to, or we aim to, or we hope to statements. But that isn't the case. But by adopting a framework and by saying this is the framework we are reporting against, this is the data we have, these are our commitments based on that, then you move away from that and you move into being very clear about how seriously sustainability is taken by your business. It's very easy to write a statement that says, we understand that we're producing carbon and we would like to reduce it. It's a lot harder to say, in line with this framework, we have calculated our CO2 emissions, we understand it's this much, and we are seeking to reduce it by doing these things. But right from the start of that process, you are much more committed to sustainability. And by adopting the framework, you demonstrate that, I think, very effectively. There we go. Are there any quick wins? Are there any early benefits to adopting the framework? I think yes. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't think we'd be doing this webinar. But I think they're very important to highlight. It provides that clear route to sustainability momentum. I have had so many first meetings with companies over the years who have said, well, we we want to do it. We've got commitment from the board, the CEO, the CFO are all up, all in agreement. We want to do more with sustainability. We want to take this seriously. It's going to be a part of our business. What do we need to do? The great thing about the frameworks is they give you that first step. They are the starting blocks that your feet go on at the start of the race, and you know exactly where to push off from. It tells you what kind of information you're going to need. It tells you how good the information is going to have to be. It tells you how you're going to collate it. It tells you what you need to start. And that's it. It gives you that shortcut, that first momentum forwards. And when you have that, you can kind of kick off. You can kick off from there. It's it helps you in terms of methodologies, it helps you in terms of the actual KPIs, the indicators, the bits of data you're going to need. It just provides you that first oomph. There's a, there's a word that sounds better with a Welsh accent. It also provides a shortcut to gravitas. And I think this is something that's very worth being aware of. In the last few years, it's been in decline, but there have been several significant instances of greenwash in terms of sustainability reporting. And they are very rarely missed, but they are still out there. If you're adopting a framework and it's a core part of your sustainability momentum, then you will not, we hope, fall into the greenwash traps. We, Yes, there are some companies out there that have deliberately produced greenwash, but there are also some who who strayed into that you know, through no fault of their own. They've chosen initiatives or they've been unfortunate in projects that haven't delivered what they hoped they would, and so they've strayed off the path and ended up in in a world of greenwash. The frameworks that are out there aren't there to help you do that. They help, they're there to help you stay away from that. It will keep you on the track that you need to be on. It will provide you that shortcut to gravitas. It will keep you honest, for want of a better term, in terms of sustainability data and in terms of sustainability reporting and in terms of 
sustainability being embedded in the business purpose. So how do you choose the right framework? As I said when we started talking about this, there are so many out there and it's growing and it's growing and it's growing. The simple answer is understand what you want to talk about. Sustainability, I was talking about this quite recently with a colleague of mine, sustainability data and sustainability conversations need to connect with your external and with your, in, and with your internal stakeholders. And if you know what the issues are that you want to talk about, and you know how you want to talk about them, and this goes back to materiality as well, then you can choose the right frameworks for you. Be aware that there is overlap. If you're collecting data for SASB, then there's a fairly good chance that you're also going to be collecting nearly all, if not all, of the data that you would need for the Carbon Disclosure Project or for Dow Jones Sustainability Index. So the thing you can do is you can start to map out a path through the different frameworks. If one framework gets you 80% of framework two and 65% of framework three, then surely by the end of year five or year six, you can look at expanding where you're reporting on. It can keep you moving forward. I think adopting a framework isn't just about getting that seal on your report. It's about it being a part of your sustainability journey. And so exploit framework overlap if you can. It gives you a great opportunity to grow what you're talking about in quite an organic way. So there we go on that one. So my final thoughts and my final advice on materiality and on frameworks. Materiality analysis will allow you to know what you need to talk about. The frameworks will help you make sure you talk about the things you should be talking about. But it's also about your own commitment. And if you know what you want to be talking about, and if you know how you want to say it, then it will make sure that what you say has got weight behind it. The materiality will, will help you absolutely know what's important to your business. Frameworks will help you know what's important to the broader world and make sure that you communicate those things effectively. But having clear ambition will make sure that what you say really changes how people view your company. And then last thing I think is, is an obvious one for me. Frameworks will help you be authentic, will help you communicate how seriously you take sustainability. So use them for that. There you go. And now I'm going to pass you over to Levi. And he's going to talk a little bit about SASB. Great. Thanks, Joe. Um, I will just uh, take take control here of the presentation. Uh, hopefully everyone can see my screen here now. Um, and yeah, just a little background on myself and uh, before we get into SASB. So uh, I'm the sector analyst for the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. And the particular sector that I focus on is consumer staple products. So these are um, you know, companies that work in food, beverage, uh, tobacco, as well as household and uh, consumer goods. And I came to SASB with a, with a background in accounting, so um, really kind of that background enlightened me or showed me that there's a lot of these other capitals that uh, companies you know, rely on to, to add value to society that they're maybe not being a, as well accounted for uh, through our current financial reporting frameworks, you know, those things like human capital or environmental capital. And, and, um, so I was really interested in, in working with SASB to, to get a better understanding of how, to, how we can capture those, those sort of capitals that, that really do add value to the company. So today I, I want to go through and, and give you all a little background on the momentum that we've seen in the investor use, uh, as well as the general stakeholder use of sustainability information uh, and the associated need for standards and really the value that those standards uh, you know, present to both investors and corporations alike. You know, as, as Joe pointed out, there there's a lot of uh, different frameworks, different uh, standards or data providers that are that are in this space, and, and so I think it's important to kind of get a visualization as to you know how these how these look uh, and what the what the 
the sustainability space really looks like and, and, and how each you know, organization um, is important and, and what space they cover. So you know, kind of in that, on that left-hand side, you see those, those data providers or indices that we consider you know, more proprietary. Um, in general, they're, they're maybe not disclosing, um, the, they're, not, they're maybe not a framework, but more of a, a means or a rating tool to, to assert a performance uh, on how companies are, are, are performing with regard to sustainability. So those are things like the Job Jones Sustainability Index, MSCI or Bloomberg, uh, really important tools for, for people to understand uh, corporate performance, um, but, but maybe less so of, a, of an actual guidance in terms of what to report. And then, of course, there's, there's larger reporting frameworks such as GRI that, that have a, a broader stakeholder view. Uh, in terms of you know who who they see as the audience of sustainability information, and up in the upper right hand corner we kind of see you know SASB and, and CDP with with you know the, both their focus on on investors, uh, but with SASB having a little bit uh, broader scope in terms of you know beyond environmental or, or those sort of impacts to include social and governance as well. And that's really what we see is as setting SASB aside is is kind of this focus on what material sustainability information is to investors. And, and I think that's why there's, there's really no coincidence that you see SASB up there in that right-hand corner and there, the you know, U.S. Uh, generally accepted accounting principles and the, the international financial reporting standards. Um, it's that focus on what's material to investors. So when we look at what's material to investors at the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, we use the, the same definition that the Supreme Court has set forth you know, that, that essentially lays out that you know, disclosure of, an, of the omitted fact you know, would have changed the view of a reasonable investor or, or at least altered their total mix of information. And it's that you know, incorporation of, of the Supreme Court's definition of materiality and the industry by industry's focus that SASB's taken uh, to develop standards that we think that really helps you know, make that apples to apples or oranges to oranges comparison that, that Jeff spoke about uh, and really furthers the value of, of sustainability information by creating a standard for it. And really the, the need that we see for these standards is, is largely a result of the high level of noise that, that both investors and, stake, and, and other stakeholders are presented with and, and must sort through when reviewing sustainability disclosure. And largely, you know, we see this noise is, is the result of companies working to address pressures from, from numerous different sources without a standard, standardized medium to do so. So to be sure, you know, we see a value in sustainability standards and, and feel that that's derived from the current need for a common language to cut through all of this noise. Yeah. And just to give you an idea of what these pressures are that we see, you know, you got things like consumer pressures uh, that include both business to business consumers, you know, thinking large retail sustainability questionnaires being uh, passed up to their suppliers, as well as individuals that raise concerns, you know, in, in somewhat of an ad hoc manner as, as they gain, you know, uh, steam in the media or, or in other, you know, channels. And, and we see these pressures that really show the evolving values of society where businesses are increasingly concerned about you know, the environment and social impacts of the supply chain and individuals, you know, really want to feel good about the products that they purchase. Of course, you know, there's, we, we believe there's other pressures, too, that, that are pushing companies to really focus on sustainability, and that includes, you know, economic pressures. So, you know, companies are increasingly aware that there's resource constraints, you know, whether it's operating in, you know, water stress regions or the, you know, volatility in energy prices. Um, and, of course, you know, any pressures that climate change could, could put on you know, both the bottom line and, and, and of course, the need to, to effectively manage that bottom line. And then, you know, without, you know, it wouldn't would be a good webinar if we didn't talk about regulatory pressure. So uh, more and more, you know, we see increasing regulatory scrutiny, both, you know, it, through, through things like the California Air Resources Board bill that, you know, works to, to cap and trade at climate or uh, greenhouse gas emissions, as well as, you know, things like the European Directive on Packaging and, and Packaging Waste. So, we see these regulations as really pressuring companies to focus on their sustainability challenges. And, and really, it's despite all these pressures, uh, we've noticed that investors and others are still having difficulties you know, in understanding which sustainability topics actually impact the performance of a business. 
I think that's a lot of value in terms of creating standards and, and taking that you know material lens that, that Joe has been talking about. You know, and truth be told, we don't see these pressures uh, you know dwindling in the future. So uh, you know, taking a, taking a look at the investor use or you know applications of sustainable and responsible investing, uh, we see that you know. Investors are increasingly starting to integrate sustainability into their decision making, and I think this graph really speaks to that. You know, you see a, a huge increase from two trillion dollars in 2005 to nearly seven trillion dollars in 2014 of assets in the United States managed for you know responsible or sustainable investing uh, principles, and even more so globally. So you know, in Europe, it's huge. It's it's gaining steam even faster, and and. Uh, worldwide, there's $59 trillion in assets under management according to the United Nations Principles of Responsible Investment. So we see this as a, a huge momentum for you know, the need to standardize uh, these sustainability reports, not just because uh, it's useful to stakeholders, but it's really integral for investors to have that apples to apples comparison. And you know, I think there's, there's you know, some support for this claim that if we look at the current level of dissatisfaction with you know what we call environmental or social environmental social and governance disclosure, it's pretty clear that you know across the board uh, that sustainability disclosure is is not really satisfying the marketplace, and this is indicated by the by the PwC study that you see which supports the graphs. And really, it, it, it boils down to some simple things. It's, there's a lack of understanding, I think, for, from both companies and investors on what is material. And further, there's little benchmarking or the ability to benchmark due to the lack of standards, which really means that companies and investors alike don't have decision useful information. And that's what, why we see this you know, resulting dissatisfaction. And to be clear, you know, I think um, both both investors and, and, and other stakeholders have a point. Uh, you know, based on recent SASB research into the uh, Form 10Ks and 20Fs, which are the financial annual filings that companies make for the United States Securities and Exchange Commission, we really see that most disclosure is of little use. So when companies actually do disclose, uh, what, what we see is the information on sustainability topics is often very boilerplate language. Uh, it's language that if you if you've ever read a 10K, you're probably familiar with. It looks um, it looks as if if I may be blunt, like one one law firm wrote it for all of the companies. So you really can't tell one one company from another. There's 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 it's very difficult to understand uh, anything besides a, a generic idea that, that a risk may be there, and you really don't see how that risk may be uh, well managed or could be managed better by a particular company, and, and so. You see this standardized text, but but it's it's really not the standard that we're calling for. <laughs> you know what we want is is those standardized metrics that, that you know small little gray bar on the right hand side. Those metrics that you know really allow for the disclosure to be decision useful. And and you know I think that these these uh, the lack of you know this decision useful disclosure has has led to kind of an ad hoc approach to gaining sustainability information from, from investors and other stakeholders. You know, because of this dissatisfaction and this gap in decision usefulness, investors and other stakeholders are trying to better understand corporate sustainability performance through things like questionnaires and other information requests. And, and you know, this is leading to a huge burden for, for corporations. I think this, what you see here in this slide is, uh, you know, an example from GE, but I'm sure it's felt more broadly in terms of just the sheer broad scope of information requests. So in 2014, GE, you know, developed had to develop responses to more than 650 requests, and that's just from ratings groups alone. You know, this is a three-month or more process that involves 75 employees, uh, and and it's still unclear as its benefit to to the company or its stake the shareholders. It's kind of this lack of, of standardized approach that's, that's really you know, hindering companies and investors and other stakeholders alike. And we really think this is a, you know, a scenario that's not uncommon and, and results in part from the fact that most questionnaires and surveys fail to focus on you know, those truly material uh, sustainability topics. And so this is what the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board was really developed to do. You know, SASB seeks to cut through this noise 
we, we, we take a focus on an industry by industry basis on those specific sustainability standards that we feel you know are truly financially material to companies and and we help the company we believe will help the companies and investors communicate on sustainability information that truly impacts the performance of a business so really taking sustainability from you know as Joe, Joe had pointed out is you know by some people being used as greenwashing and bringing it to a place where it's really core to the business we, we see these uh, topics is you know really driving uh, value to companies and investors and society at large so I think it's important that we have these type of standards to communicate the, the really strong work that's being done and, and uh, to have that accountability there for to encourage you know the strong work to be upheld and, and even further and so it's this laser sharp focus on information that's financially material that really enables both companies and investors to benchmark performance and manage risks in a, in a really meaningful manner. So just, just as there are you know, numerous reporting frameworks for sustainability, there's numerous definitions for sustainability. Uh, it seems to be hard for, any, for anyone to, to agree on one definition. Uh, but just to kind of lay out SASB's view of sustainability, so you know, SASB takes, a, uh, takes kind of a, uh, what I think is a holistic view in terms of, you know, considering five different kind of universes of sustainability topics. So those include environment, social capital, human capital, business model and innovation, and then leadership and governance. And, and within these five different capitals, we look at 30 plus different topics that, that cover the, the different dimensions of sustainability. And, and, and we take this kind of broad view of sustainability, and then on each industry by industry basis, we whittle it down to those topics that are you know, truly the, those that are most important to a business's bottom line and its, and, and its longevity uh, and, and make sure that they, they really are you know, financially material to a company. And what we found through, through the, up this process is really that taking an industry by industry approach to sustainability is incredibly important. As, as Joe pointed out, Again, you know, I, I tell you, he's on to something <laughs> through all his experience. But no industry is the same, no sector is the same, and, and you know, certainly no company is the same. And so, it's a, it's important to at least have an, an industry, you know, specific approach so that we can we can tease out these differences, you know, at least on an industry level. If we can't do it on a company level, and what we've seen is, you know, across the ten sectors and seventy nine industries. That, that truly no two industries are alike. And even those sustainability issues that are nearly ubiquitous, so take for example climate change, they tend to manifest in different ways from one industry to the next. And, and that, that's why it's really important for investors and other stakeholders to have this specialized and standardized disclosure on these risks so they, and, and opportunities to be honest, so they can fully understand the nature of their risk exposures. And the early indication that, that we've had from recent research that includes a you know, pretty thought-provoking Harvard uh, research paper really validates this process. So uh, just to take you through this, this paper, because I think it's pretty interesting and speaks to the importance of you know, industry-specific, materi materially-focused standards, uh, the, the paper found that firms that perform well on, on material sustainability factors enjoy enhanced accounting as well as market returns over firms that perform poorly on these factors. And I think you know what's really so interesting is that big red box that you see and it's it's the fact that those firms that perform well on material factors and focus less so on immaterial factors outperform the market by, by more than six percent. So what, it, what you're seeing there is really by focusing your resources on those sustainability topics that truly impact financial performance, well, you, you see a benefit to, to your firm value. The, what's also interesting to point out, uh, and I, I think goes back to that you know, GE case study we, we just talked about, is the fact that the, the same paper found that more than, or about 80% of corporate disclosure on sustainability is immaterial. So it has little or no correlation to financial performance. So there's a lot of really great work that's being done out there on sustainability. Um, but, you know, I think it, it could be a little bit more focused and through a standardized approach, you know, we really could add value through, through this discussion. 
Ah, so the, the wonders of a standard. So I'm sure everyone's been dying to see what I mean by, by a standard or a sustainability standard. So taking the, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, or SASB's uh, standard, what you see here is, you know, you, you've got the, the broad industry, you know, topic on the left-hand side, and then, you know, for, for each one of those topics, we, we develop, you know, a, one or two metrics, sometimes three, that really try to uh, speak to the, the most important information. So these are what you might consider the, the key performance indicator. And at, at this point in time, the SASB averages five disclosure topics and 13 metrics uh, per industry. So it's really a, what we think is the, the minimal amount of disclosure for you know, capturing how sustainability truly impacts financial performance. And across the board, you know, 75% of these standards are quantitative, which is great because we think, you know, that, that really helps with the benchmarking and decision usefulness. But of course, there's a need for qualitative disclosure, and that's where the other 25% comes in. There's a need, you know, for point of discussion and analysis. Uh, and and like, like we've been talking about, each company is unique, and so there needs to be that context. Um, each company has its own strategy, and it's important to understand that. And that's really where the contextual factors come in. So then digging down a little bit further below the accounting metric and into the actual standard, uh, what you see there is, is a technical protocol for compiling data. And the idea behind these uh, protocols is, is really to um, you know, help companies have a due process for preparing their reports. Uh, and it also serves as suitable criteria for you know, third party external assurance. So you know, more and more I think that as sustainability becomes key, key business information, we'll, we'll see this growth in need for assurance. And by having these technical protocols, it really allows for uh, those companies that, are, that need assurance and, and the validators of that data to come through and, and have the appropriate criteria to assess their reports. So it's in this way that SASB standards really enable companies to deliver you know, reliable, trustworthy data you know, that's likely to provide material information to the markets. So to give you a, a little bit of an idea, you know, previously we, we kind of saw that bar chart where we talked about boilerplate uh, disclosure and, and industry specific and metrics. And, and to give you an idea of what that boilerplate disclosure looks like, you know, on the left hand side we see one alcoholic beverages company report. And this is from their, their SEC filings. You know, it speaks to the fact that water is becoming scarce, that it could potentially present significant risks to the company's operations. But other than that, you really don't have much insight into how the company is managing it, you know, whether it, and the degree to which that the company may be at risk due to water. Whereas in the middle, this is a, you know, another uh, disclosure from, a, from an SEC filing, you see, a, a, another but different alcoholic beverages company talk about how they've been working to reduce their water use, um, how they've you know, been or how exposed they are to water stress and really their work to, to focus on reducing water use in those water stressed regions. So they're taking a, you know, a, an approach that's strategic, that's pointed and, and really making sure that they're, they're managing these risks. But, but at the same time that the challenge there as great as, the, as those metrics are, it's of little use if you're trying to benchmark it because, well, not all every company is reporting on, on the same topic or, the, or reporting the same metrics, and so you can't really compare one to another. And that's where we see the SASB standards as presenting a lot of value. You know, pointing that discussion in a, in a way that allows for an understanding of the scale of risk, that allows for the, you know, exposure to water stress, and, and then also kind of, you know, in addition to any sort of metrics, could draw out strategy in terms of how these risks are being managed. Sorry, I jumped, jumped around there a bit. But um, just to, to kind of give an idea or a little insight as to what this looks like on a, uh, on a reporting framework. So what you have here is greenhouse gas emissions, widely standardized. And I think you really see the value here when you look at electric utilities of, of what a standard can do by providing that benchmark information. You know, you see that there's obviously leaders on the far left. Um, maybe they're less exposed. Maybe they have a slightly different business model or their renewables. 
see somewhat of a cluster there around you know 400 to 500 uh, metric tons per uh, gigawatt hour, and then you have the kind of right hand side, and so these are the companies that maybe are more exposed to um, you know greenhouse gas regulations if they were to come about. And I think this is important just to gain an understanding of you know leaders, laggers, and then of course it's all important to understand within the context of, of each company's operating environment. Now let's take a look at another idea, you know, or another sustainability topic that we see is you know really gaining steam, and that's the growth in health and nutrition products. So right now they're projected that by 2017 the health and nutrition portfolio uh, or total sales will grow to one trillion dollars. But here again, uh, you know, SASB research shows that there's a lack of current disclosure with 60% of that, of that disclosure that's in the market right now on this topic is, is that boilerplate disclosure or really isn't even being disclosed. And that's why we've developed a standard that focuses on you know, understanding revenue from products that are labeled or marketed to promote health and nutrition attributes. So when we look at that, you know, how companies are addressing this. The challenge here, again, and I think this, this speaks to, to why it's so important to have these, these disclosures, is, is that you know, on the left-hand side, there's, there's no information on the Bloomberg terminal for someone who wanted to benchmark all these companies. And on the right-hand side, it's clear you know, each company is trying to address this in, in various ways. Um, and just because there's a lack of standard, there's, there's little to no comparability, even though it's widely recognized as a very important topic. And then just kind of one, one more example in terms of you know, the value of a, of, of a sustainability disclosure that we see. So here what you have is the red bar shows the savings per pound of packaging reduction. So the dollar savings divided by the number of pounds reduced. And then the gray bars show you the, the total savings in millions of dollars from packaging reduction. So a lot of companies are focusing on reducing packaging, you know, both as a sustainability initiative and as, as a financial one. There's a lot of value to be had from, from reducing packaging, and, and companies are, are quickly realizing this. And so you see how valuable this data can be in, in terms of understanding how effectively companies can save money per pound of reduction. But of course here it's another case where this data, although it looks great, when you, when you look into it more, it, it lacks a standardized approach, which, which really reduces its comparability. So whereas you know, Pepsi reports data for one year and Coke reports data for two years, Dr. Pepper reports its data over the course of seven years. And these are all in disparate places. So there's really not one single source you can go to to understand what is this one company doing this year, what have they done last year, and what have they done the year before to get an idea of, of what the current trends are and and really how they're you know, managing this topic on a year-on-year -year basis. So one, one kind of final example of, of you know, where we see these sustainability disclosures being important is in food safety. Uh, you know, we recently saw the, this horrible incident with Chipotle happen where their stock price has lost significant value uh, and the brand's really facing a, a reputational challenge. And, and of course that's trying to say that standards would, would have averted this situation, but it's one of those classic adages of, you know, you can't manage it if you don't measure it. And having a standard approach, we think, will really help companies to, to better manage these topics and hopefully, you know, catch them before they arise to these really significant uh, instances uh, that, that can really detract from the firm's value. So understanding that, you know, I want to leave some time for questions. Gonna, going to talk quickly through these next couple of slides, but this, this is just an idea. What the, the idea behind this slide is to, is to give you perspective on what the future could look like. You know, it's one where an analyst, an investor, or a, another stakeholder can go into a, you know, a, a database, search out the information, and, a, and really understand a peer-by-peer -peer comparison with a complete data set of, of quality topics that are presented through standardized metrics that allows for you know, benchmarking and, and really strong comparability between one company and another for people to make the determinations that, that they see fit. And this is a, an approach that SASBs have a lot of, a lot of support for. So it's, it's not something that we're, we're going at alone. Uh, corporations 
um, and investors alike have, have really spoken out and, and acknowledged that, um, that the SASB standard and, and a standardized approach in general is a really important cost-effective way to address the sustainability issues that we see. And these companies that have integrated sustainability into their business strategies, you know, they're, they're beginning to embrace this idea and I think we'll see this you know, continue to emerge as sustainability becomes core to, to business performance as well as you know, to, to general societal concerns. And so understanding that this is a, you know, an emerging field and sustainability seems to be you know, growing at an exceedingly quick pace with uh, changes every day in terms of you know, perspective on, on how to address sustainability. SASB offers a broad spectrum of tools and resources that are, you know, by and large are, are free. You know, I don't think any one of these things out there costs money except for that FSA credential. So we really see ourselves as kind of an open source means for people to gain an, an understanding on how sustainability uh, truly does impact uh, financial value. You know, so it's things like the implementation guidance that help companies to understand how they can implement uh, SASB standards or how they can perform materiality assessments with a, a lens of financial materiality or the SASB research briefs that develop the evidence for why SASB has created the, the standards that it has. And of course the standards navigator which is a great tool. I, I encourage everyone who has a, has, hasn't already to, to go ahead and use it. It's a free tool and it allows you to explore the standards for each industry and really understand um, you know, what these standards look like and, and how they can be really beneficial you know, when, you're, when you're trying to develop an approach to measure those, those topics that are truly important to your business's uh, well-being. So really in conclusion, you know, we see that standards and sustainability reporting provide value by aligning internal efforts on sustainability topics that drive long-term value, that provide leadership with focused measurements, and these are standards that can be benchmarked to their competitors, or companies that can be benchmarked to their competitors, you know, while enhancing management's understanding of the key sustainability issues facing their company. I think standardized sustainability reporting has some very exciting potential. It's a future I certainly look forward to, and I really hope you all agree that standardizing these sustainability reports can add value to companies, to investors, and really to other stakeholders alike. So yeah, without further ado, you know, I. I'm always open for questions. Feel free to reach out if you have any further ones that don't get answered on this call. And uh, you know, I look forward to any questions that, that we can answer here today. Okay, thanks, Levi. Um, so what I'm going to do very quickly because I've got a final slide that I think I should be able to show, which is that. And should pop up, so it's time for questions. So we've already got a couple. Uh, Let's kind of fly through these, I guess. Um, there's one that came in that I love, so I'm going to ask you straight away, and then I'm going to start talking because I like the sound of this one. So this is, with so many different definitions for materiality and sustainability, not to mention a large number of reporting frameworks, companies will spend a lot of money trying to keep up with these trends. Do you think there is a risk that companies are becoming distracted by reporting trends instead of taking real sustainability action? Um, if I go first, Levi, I'll throw it to you for thoughts afterwards, if you don't mind. Um, I mean, my first instinct on this is, is yes, there's definitely a real chance of that. Um, we, or I, or we, have definitely talked about, um, we, I think we call it KPI fatigue, um, as being a real problem with sustainability data capture. Um, we see it reasonably frequently. Um, um, I know we started talking to one client uh, a while back and they were collecting more than 500 bits of data every month on just their manufacturing environmental footprint. 500. That's too much. Um, there's, no, there's, no, yeah, there's no explanation apart from it was just too much. Um, they had built a requirement set then someone else needed some more stuff, so they added some more questions. Then someone else asked them some more questions, so they needed some more indicators, and it grew, and it grew, and it grew. And it's that kind of snowball thing. Once, once it starts rolling, it's very easy for things to be tacked on and tacked on and tacked on. If I'm honest, I think frameworks can guard against it to an extent, because if you stay aligned to a specific framework or to a plan that includes one or more specific frameworks, then you stay on on track with those and it gives you the chance to offer those. I think it's the tendency 
all a desire to please everybody who asks you a question that can be the biggest impetus behind this kind of KPI fatigue. Because you'll ask too many questions. You, know, you will try to answer too many questions. Sometimes it, I think it's better for companies to come back and say, well, actually, we capture that. We don't frame the question exactly like that. We frame it like this. Here's our response to that one. What do you think? Um, sometimes that'll do, sometimes it won't. But yeah, I think that's quite a meandering answer, but it wasn't a short question either. Levi, do you have any thoughts on that one? Yeah, absolutely, uh, Joe, and, and I think this is a great question to have proposed it. Um, and certainly, you know, the, one that, that almost spawns SASB, um, because there are so many different frameworks out there. That's really why SASB has taken this kind of materiality lens to help to try and refocus sustainability on those topics that, that are actually, you know, really driving the, the value of a business. I think it's easy to, to get led astray, and I, I hear this from a lot of companies, you know, we we did ask this question once, and how do I know that I that if I don't respond to it, you know that that it's okay, and and that's challenging. But as Joe just pointed out, you know I think you don't need to answer the same question ten different ways, and that's why these sustainability frameworks are really important. I also think it's important for you know the sustainability frameworks such as SASB to work with others to to align, because in the end of the day the those topics that are truly important to a business and to its stakeholders, whether they be investors or, or a wider audience, uh, you know, are largely the same. And so we should just be asking the same question in, this, in the same way um, and really focusing on, on those sustainability topics that actually impact a business. Brilliant. Thanks, Levi. Um, okay, there's one here which is, I'm not even going to try and answer it, but I'm going to ask it directly of you, which is, what companies besides Bloomberg have adopted SASB? If, if all major players in the industry haven't adopted it, there won't be comparability. Well, that's reasonably true, but I think that's not going to happen. Uh, I think it's got a bit more adoption than that already. Um, and what is SASB doing to promote adoption? And how have the conversations with the SEC progressed? Yep, that one's all for you, Levi. I have yeah. nothing to say. <laughs> Several great questions in one. Um, so besides Bloomberg, we've seen a lot of interest from other companies. Um, I know one small craft brewery has, has started to disclose SASB standards, which I think is a great report. Um, I'd point anyone to it from Appalachian Mountain Brewery. Very small company, but, but a lot of larger companies are starting to mention you know, SASB and, and are interested in us. Um, but to be sure, right now where we're at is, is SASB's released its provisional set of metrics. And what we're doing for the next 12 to 18 months is really a, a period of deep consultation and engagement with corporations and investors alike to get, a, to get an understanding of any last tweaks we need to make to our provisional standards uh, before we go forth and codify them. So you know, this, this year we'll be making a, a really strong push to, to hear from companies what we need to do to make sure that our standards are cost effective for them to report on and to hear from investors if there's any tweaks we need to make to make sure our standards are decision useful for them, so um, so I think we'll we'll hope to see a lot of a lot more uh, momentum in terms of adoption, but certainly a lot of interest in the SASB standards. And you know, Joe, you, you probably understand how much it, how much effort it takes to to implement one of these frameworks. It's not something that happens overnight, um, but we we are certainly encouraged by the by the the various discussions and interests that we're seeing in the marketplace. Now, there, I know there was another question in there. I think about the SEC, maybe I, I hope I didn't miss any of the other ones. Uh, you know, SASB is basically, we, we just try and work with the SEC to, to make sure that not, we're not you know, stepping on any toes, we're staying within their, guide, their guidelines. Uh, you know, it's, we're, we're, we're still, in, and for as long as I, I foresee, will always be a voluntary initiative and a, and a ways to really meet the SEC's guidance on, on reporting material information, you know, in a way that, that really addresses uh, uh, investors, yeah, you know, interests. So I think companies are, are addressing SEC guidelines, but but um, you know, could obviously do more to to really add value to uh, investors and and also to their you know internal uh, folks that are trying to manage these risks and opportunities. Brilliant, thanks, Steve. Um, we are officially over time, but there's a question that's just popped in that I want to answer quite quickly, which doesn't really re 
relate to SAFP. So this is, do you see a chance for the different sustainability reporting frameworks to cooperate and make a commonly accepted framework that could be used globally? Um, I mean, the short answer is there is already cooperation between some of the frameworks. I know and that um, GRI and CDP have done joint uh, kind of guidelines and and material on how you can report for both. I am sure that, and um, Levi, I don't know if you want to jump in here, I'm sure that that isn't a million miles yeah, away from some of your thinking, is Sorry, yeah, SASB has also worked with um, with CDP and we have an, an MOU in terms of, you know, making sure that we, we work to align and, um, you know, I think as much as we can, alignment is great and understanding that, that certain frameworks have, have different perspectives, but I think we should all be measuring the same, the topics we, we think are important in the same way. Yeah, uh, I think that's quite a nice point to leave out, which is that, you know, these frameworks are there, they are there to help companies report on sustainability effectively. Yeah, whether or not it's the same way, we'll see as time goes on, but it is certainly there to help out. Um, we are over time, I always, we always are, um, but only by two minutes, so really that's a win from my perspective. Um, I want to thank Levi uh, for coming along from SASB and, and talking so eloquently about the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, um, and I want to thank you all for coming along. We will keep doing these webinars, we enjoy them, I certainly enjoy talking, uh, as so, several of you already know. Uh, if you have any recommendations for future topics, please get in touch. If you have any questions we haven't covered and you want to ask them, please get in touch. We're on Twitter, we're on LinkedIn, we're on everything, I think. Uh, stay tuned, I'm sure there'll be more of these to come. Thank you very much, Tom. Have a lovely day, everybody. Goodbye. Okay,